Hello and welcome to another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall of Bearded Kendall. I will be your host as always. And let's talk about the Wattpack Townsville 400. Um, we had an interesting weekend. We had a one fairly standard race and one very exciting wild and chaotic race. Um, but... Let's start with, actually, let's go all the way back and start with some news uh, coming straight out of Darwin, is that um, Tim Slade was actually given the wildcard chassis. So the chassis that Jack Smith has been using in various weekends due to the events at Darwin, where you'll remember, I think every single car, I think every single BJR car <laughs> had an accident that weekend. Um, so clearly they couldn't fix Tim Slade's chassis. In time for uh, Townsville. Well, they've run out of chassis or whatever. Um, so they're now using Jack Smith's chassis uh, for Tim Slade. Um, I think maybe you can probably... I don't know. I don't know. You can't really infer much from this. Maybe Nick Perkett is the number one driver, but whatever. Um, it's pretty hard to infer anything. It's possible that Slade just crashed more heavily. Um, but that's fine. Um, uh, didn't really notice any performance dips for Slade, uh, during Townsville, so, uh, didn't end up making a huge difference, but I thought it was mentioning for any Tim Slade fans that might be out there. Um, if you thought maybe there was something wrong, then that's probably what it was. Also, if you're wondering why Richie Stanaway wasn't on the grid again, he's still out with his neck issues. He's been out with neck issues for the last two rounds, um, and I thought he'd be back uh, for this one for sure, because it's been three weeks since Darwin, and it's been six weeks since he was initially out. Um, he participated at Saturday at Winton, uh, but not on the Sunday race. Uh, he hasn't participated in any supercars-related events since then, um, and there's been a little bit more information about that. Um, he was uh, confirmed in the post-Winton MRI to have a nerve impingement in his neck, uh, so he's not having any surgery. He's instead undergoing anti-inflammatory treatments and a cortisone injection uh, following a Darwin flare-up, so it looks like... Uh, it actually got worse just before Darwin. Um, this has obviously put Gary Rogers Motorsport in a bit of a tight spot in terms of drivers. Uh, you might have noticed that they had Chris Piffer for Darwin. Uh, now Michael Caruso was here for Townsville. Um, and that's because they're, sort of, they're expecting him to come back and the news is a bit all over the place for them, which is unfortunate for them. Um, but... Uh, that's the way it goes. Uh, so I have some quotes here from Gary Rogers. Um, obviously, we thought he'd be back here by now. On the medical advice I've gotten, there's an issue that is not right, he said. Uh, my concern is that it seems to be that everyone thinks it's all right and that it's not all right. That's very difficult for us as a team to continually work around. I can only be advised by what the best medical people should know, so I'm only going on that. He wants to drive, and every time I speak to him about it, he says it's improving, but then it's not improving. He's of the opinion that he'll be right for Queensland Raceway, uh, but I'm not so sure of that, and neither is he, I don't think. Um, obviously, with endurance races coming up, this is getting <laughs> it's getting a bit troublesome for them. He's also a brand ambassador for Boost Mobile, um, so having him off the grid is bad for pretty much the team, the whole team and everyone involved. Um, it's unfortunate that he has an injury. I'm sure he's upset about it just as much. Um, because he seems like he's physically fine. He just struggles to hold his neck up uh, due to the pain in his neck. And uh, when you're driving a car, your neck experiences quite a lot of G-forces from going around corners and things. So uh, he needs to have that neck strength. Um, it doesn't look like um, there'll be any permanent consequences because he'll be uh, from his absence. I uh, hope for him, for his sake, that they don't decide to drop him for whatever reason permanently um, because he's gone for so long. Uh, but weirder things have happened. Um, 
And Chris Pifford did a really good job in that car at Darwin. Um, but um, hopefully he is back for Queensland. It's always unfortunate to see a driver away due to injury that they can't. I mean, he didn't even sustain it in a crash. I don't think it just he just got it like. <laughs> that sucks <laughs> so uh hopefully he's back for queensland and he can race in the endurance races and things that would be good to see and then after that after those two brief updates to tim slade and richie stanaway let's dive into the weekend as it happened so first we'll start with practice one uh where Kelly Racing was fined $2,000 after a torch fell out of Simona Di Silvestro's Nissan uh, during practice one. So uh, she was just driving around the track and uh, you can see a little object pop off at um, turn 10. That's the one. Um, and it was confirmed to be a torch that someone had left on the under tray. <laughs> um, which is unfortunate for the team and uh i'm sure whoever left that torch there is not not had a fun weekend <laughs> um because two thousand dollars is a lot of money to pay for a uh, for misplacing a torch um <laughs> so that sucks for them a little bit weird a little bit funny but um that's the way things go you can't just leave loose objects on top of cars because <laughs> it's obviously quite dangerous um so then we move into qualifying it was quite wet the practice sessions which saw some various people at the top including Cameron Waters and Lee Holdsworth uh, good on them leading some sessions but for qualifying it was David Reynolds who came out on top with a 1 minute 12.1 an absolute monster lap that was a whole tenth faster than Chas Moster in second place with a 1 minute 12.2 um, then after that the field tightens up considerably with the times, it was a good, it was a great qualifying session. It really was, and it was good to see the field really tight again after a few blowout performances um, earlier in the year. So behind Chaz, we had Scott McLaughlin with a one minute twelve point three zero three zero one. Sorry, uh, Shane Van Gisbergen in fourth for one minute twelve point three two three, followed by Will Davison and for one minute twelve point three three four. Jamie Winkup with a one minute twelve point three seven six and lee holds over one minute twelve point four so every from scott mclaughlin to lee holdsworth separated by less than a tenth um great stuff really really good stuff uh andre heimgartner up in eighth place good on him um and cameron waters in ninth mark would bottom with another top 10 appearance he's doing a good job this season in qualifying uh, Nick Perkat and Anton Di Pasquale down in 12th. Fabian Coulthard with a, a performance he'd probably rather forget in 13th with Todd Hazelwood in 14th. Good on him. He's doing really good this year. I've been pretty impressed with his performance uh, considering where that team was at last year as well. It's good to see them up. Uh, Rick Kelly at num- uh, in 15th spot followed by Tim Slade in the Jack Smith chassis. Uh, James Courtney in 17th. The Walkinshaw Andretti cars really struggling this weekend. Uh, Simona in 18th, Scott Pine 19th, Gary Jacobson in 20th, Jack LeBrock in 21st, James Golding in 22nd, Macaulay Jones in 23rd, and Michael Caruso in last. Um, yeah, the Gary Rogers cars also really struggling this year in general, uh, but this weekend especially. But it's nice to see the entire field separated by just over a second. It's good to see that type of stuff again. Um, I know it's a shorter track, but that's the sort of stuff I expect to see from supercars and then we move right on into the race um wasn't the most incredible race uh we did have a couple of incidences incidences i don't know how to say that but um the only two major incidents was that uh david reynolds led the race for a long portion during the first stint he was quite safely ahead for a while, um, with Shane Van Gisbergen, and Will Davison, uh, Scott McLaughlin, Janie Winkup, I believe, all getting stuck in traffic. Uh, Jamie Winkup choosing to take a uh, undercut option with Shane staying out long, um, and David controlling the race. When David's 
uh, David Reynolds does eventually come in. Uh, they have some problems with a wheel nut. Um, and they can't get his left rear tire onto that car. Um, so they have to take the nut out, put a new one in, and put that on. Um, and some not very nice words were exchanged. Um, so Barry Ryan basically alluding to the fact that he's going to fire the dude that that were, was putting that wheel on, which sucks because I'd hate to be under that kind of pressure. But it is not the first time this year that they've had problems with putting the wheels on during pit stops. Um, it's happened quite a few times. I can understand his frustration, uh, but David Reynolds um, uh, said was more along the lines of um, things happen, basically. Um, and he said that the car was not in contention for a race win because he didn't win, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> but they just didn't have the pace after that stop anyway. Um, he ended up finishing a little bit further down the field, but it was good to see him up there in the first stint. He was driving really well. Um, it's a shame that they had dramas there, and hopefully they don't fire their dudes for um, wheel nut issues, but that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. And um, Chaz Mostert and Will Davison had a little bit of a clash down at turn 10. Yes, the fast right-hand sweeping corner. Um, Mostert trying to stick his nose up the inside of a corner that you can't really, you don't really want to put two cars down unless they're side by side and both drivers are 100% aware of what's going on. Um, they both had big slides. Mostert eventually got through, but Davison wasn't super happy about it. Um, but afterwards, after the race, um, he basically just said that he, I didn't think it was ideal for teammates. This is a quote from Will Davison. Uh, pretty dodgy, but anyway, I'll give him a slap later. Um, so he's just, you know, he's not too beat up about it, but you do have to be careful around quick turns like that, especially how uh, dirty that side of the, the opposite side of the track gets during a race weekend. It's atrociously covered in marmals. It's awful. Um, so they're very lucky not to have an accident during the race. Um, but after Jamie Winkup comes out of the pits, um, he is eventually... After everybody else cycles through their pit stops, he is being hunted by Scott McLaughlin and Chaz Mostert. Um, Scotty manages to close the gap up to Jamie before Jamie pits again. The undercut works, but Scotty manages to catch up to him and overtake him. Uh, Chaz looks like he is going to do the same, but eventually falls off. I guess his tyres didn't have enough oomph in them. Um, and they left Shane Van Gisbergen out extremely long. Uh, he eventually comes in with about 20 laps to go. 18 laps to go, and he carves his way through the field. So he came out in ninth, eighth or ninth, and he ended up in fourth place. So your results are Scott McLaughlin in first place for a sixth straight victory, followed by Jamie Winkup in second, Chaz Mostert in third, and Shane Van Gisbergen in fourth. Good to see both the Red Bull, boy, Red Bull boys up there <laughs> this weekend. Uh, Fabian Coulthard up eight spots uh, to fifth. He made a quite a decent recovery considering where he qualified. Um, and he would have had fourth had he not had Shane not just been on uh, the much faster tyres at the end David Reynolds down five spots obviously disappointed after that pit stop but not really going in any further south after that Will Davison in seventh uh, after starting in fifth he's been looking for a podium basically all year and he's had the pace to do it um, hopefully he gets there because yeah, he's been just outside of it all season. Uh, Nick Perker in 8th, Winterbottom in ninth, and Lee Holdsworth in 10th. Uh, Anton Pasquale in 11th, Heimgartner in 12th, Courtney up 4 spots to 13th. Um, Todd Hazelwood in 14th. James Golding was a big mover. He went up 7 spots to 15th. Uh, Tim Slade behind him, followed by Rick Kelly. Macaulay Jones up 5 spots to 18th. Uh, Simona in 19th, Scott Pine in 20th. Cameron Waters down 12 spots to 21st. Uh, after he had some dramas during the day, guy just can't can't just can't get a break. <laughs> Every time he looks fast, he has some kind of issue. Um, Michael Caruso in twenty second, Jack LeBrock in twenty third, and Gary Jacobson rounding out the grid in last place. So that was fairly standard stuff. Oh, sorry about that. Just had to take a call. Um, so yeah, fairly standard. Oh, accidentally hit stop on the record. <laughs> um, 
Ooh, is that still going? All right. Cool, everything's normal again. Okay, I worked it out. Some te technical difficulties here. Um, but, what was I saying? Yeah, fairly standard event. Um, no, if nothing huge. We had some interesting strategies unfold towards the end of the day, but otherwise it was a fairly normal race. Uh, but, let's talk about the Sunday. Now, Sunday was interesting, uh, but it started off as a fairly normal qualifying session. Keeping in mind that there was a top 10 shootout for the Sunday race. So I'll go down in reverse order, starting in 24th place, just to make it a little bit more exciting. Once again, the grid separated by only a second total. Um, Michael Caruso in 24th, uh, Simona in 23rd, Gary Jacobson in 22nd, Jack LeBrock and James Golding, followed by Macaulay Jones, Mark Winterbottom in 18th. He'll be a little disappointed with himself for that. Uh, Scott Pye, Chaz Mostert, Rick Kelly, Will Davison in 14th, and Chaz Mostert in 16th. They'll be disappointed too. Uh, Nick Perkett, Jamie Winkup in 12th, Andre Heimgartner in 11th, and then your top 10 were Tim Slade. Excellent job from him to get into the top 10. Uh, Lee Holdsworth, Fabian Coulter, James Courtney. Excellent drive from him to get up that high. Uh, Anton Di Pasquale, excellent from him. Cameron Waters, Shane Van Gisbergen, Todd Hazelwood in third place, two temps off from Scott McLaughlin, an absolute monster effort from him. Um, great job. Uh, David Reynolds in second, and Scott McLaughlin in first. So, after that qualifying session, we move into the top 10 shootouts, which again, I'll go in reverse order. James Courtney in 10th spot, uh, not a huge surprise so far. They haven't really had the pace to capitalize on their top 10 appearances. Uh, Tim Slade in ninth, uh, ditto for them, basically. Not really having the pace or the tyres left to really perform in the top 10 shootout. Lee Holdsworth in eighth, Anton in seventh, Shane Van Gisbergen in sixth, Fabian Coulthard in fifth, Todd Hazelwood in fourth place. I was really going for the dude. What a brilliant lap. Um, I think that's his first top 10 appearance, top 10 shootout, and he did so well. Uh, David Reynolds in third, Scott McLaughlin in second by 0 0.0159 seconds with Cameron Waters in first place. A monster lap from him in his monster car. Uh, absolutely brilliant. A, a great top 10 shootout seeing some young faces in there. Um, I think it's Anton's third or fourth top 10 shootout. Todd Hazelwood's first, I'm pretty sure. I don't think he made it in Adelaide. Um, excellent. Really good to watch. And then, the race. All the race. Um, so, the beginning of the race, I think it's not raining, but it had just rained, so the ground is wet. Uh, most, I think everyone started on slick tyres, um, but it was borderline. And uh, you can tell it's borderline because there was immediately an incident. So, coming up into turn one, we have... David Reynolds on the inside of Scott McLaughlin, just behind, just behind Scotty. Scotty puts on the brakes. Uh, Dave thinks he can dive up the inside. There isn't. Well, I won't argue if there's enough room or not, but uh, Davey locks his front left wheel with Scotty's right rear wheel, um, which causes it instantly breaks David's steering arm. It gives Scotty a puncture. And both drivers have to limp back to the pits after lap one. Um, <laughs> it certainly livened things up. Um, it, because of David's broken steering arm, Scotty tried to turn to the corner. David was barely able to, so he ended up running into him. Again, not hard, but there was a bit of contact. Um, the incident was given as a, as a racing incident. No penalties were applied. Um, and... I'm inclined to, to agree with that that decision. Um, if anything, David would get a penalty just because he's diving up the inside. Um, and if they had ruled that David got a 10-second penalty, I don't think I'd be against that either. It's extremely borderline, basically. Um, but... um. 
yeah, it's incredibly borderline. And uh, it's lap one. It's wet. You know, David went for a gap that was only kind of just there and he sort of expected Scotty to open up a little bit. Or he reckons, as he says it, that uh, Scotty actually closed the gap a tiny amount, which stopped him from, which is what, which is why he ran into him. Um, I don't know. You know, it's really hard to definitively say. Um, I think racing incident is fair. Uh, and if anything, if anyone was going to get a penalty, it'd be David. I think he was probably a bit lucky to avoid a penalty. Um, for that incident, it was definitely op- opportunistic. That's for sure. And he just kind of sent it down the inside. Um, but, you know, uh, that's the way it goes, really. I mean, it's lap one, cold tires, wet track. Um, I'm glad that they were lenient, basically, because I want to see our guys race, you know? I want to, I want to see contact. I want to see them uh, going for dangerous moves. Not dangerous moves. I want to see them going for risky moves, you know? I want to see that. I don't want them penalizing everything. Um, so overall, I think it was a fine decision, you know, like, if you don't, if you don't agree, if you think Davey should have gotten a penalty, maybe you think Scotty should have gotten a penalty, like, you could argue either way, and, um, I wouldn't hold it against you, it wouldn't be, it's not that far-fetched that Davey should have got a penalty for that, but, it was deemed a racing incident, Scotty wasn't happy about it, though, after the race, he confronted Reynolds twice in his garage, um, both drivers basically agreeing to disagree, uh, but McLaughlin was definitely unhappy. He was an unhappy boy. Um, but, um, you know. Yeah, I mean, David seemed a bit less upset, um, but he did seem to blame Scotty. Scotty to blame David. And uh, basically, if both drivers are blaming each other, it sort of feels like a racing incident to me, to be honest. Um, Which is exactly what we got. And that's fine, you know. Uh, Some drama at the start of a race never hurt anybody. So, after that... After that, with those two drivers both limping back to the pits, we had a race in our hands. And um, it was interesting. So, the the track did start to dry out. Uh, not long into the race, it was a, a definite groove forming, a dry groove for the cars to drive in, which they did. And then, and then, the heavens opened um, just after the first round of pit stops. So, we got... Oh, I believe we had a safety car. That's right. How could I forget? Jamie Winkup crashes. <laughs> yeah, so, Jamie Winkup... Um, while the rain is just starting to come down a little bit more, he puts his wheels onto the very wide curb at the exit of... Oh, I don't remember what the corner is, but it's on the back side of the circuit. Um, and um, he basically just puts the power down on that slippery curb and goes around. Um, he runs both sides of his car into the wall, the front and the back, in the process, and he's out of the race. Um, he tries to limp back to the pits and then parks it up with an oil pressure problem um which brings out the safety car at a very awkward time for a lot of people so some people are able to get in their full 120 liters um at this pit stops because because keep in mind everyone needs to put in at least 120 liters of fuel during a race it's mandatory doesn't matter how much fuel you're using um and some people some people are just miss out some there's someone like jack lebrock he was 100 milliliters short, which is awful. Um, but that's what happens. Um, and then some people, and by some people I mean exactly one person, Anton Di Pasquale comes in and they put the wet tires on his car. So everybody else got slicks. Everyone else stayed on the slicks. or got fresh slicks. Um, Anton put on wet tires. So keep this in mind because it will become important. Um, Because about 10 laps after this, the rain starts to really come down. And suddenly, suddenly everyone starts coming into the pits for wet tires because you have to put on wet tires. It was absolutely pouring. And suddenly, little old Anton 
is in first place by 40 seconds because he already had wet tyres on. Now, I did say that some people needed more fuel. Uh, they didn't manage to get their 120 required litres in uh, at the first pit stop phase, and Anton was one of those people. However, a couple of the dudes behind him, Shane Van Gisbergen, Fabian Coulthard, Cameron Waters, they had got their 120 litres in. So... To win, basically, one of two things needed to happen. Either the track needed to dry out and everyone had to come in for slick tyres again. Um, Or Anton needed to maintain a gap of over 40 seconds (laughs) to win the race. Um, Which, not impossible, but it's not what happened. Um, So I'm sitting there with my fingers crossed, hoping that the track dries out so that we can see... Anton get his first podium this year, and his f- at, he got his first podium this year at Phillip Island, and then he get his first win. It would be amazing to watch. Um, unfortunately, that isn't what happened. Um, but towards the end of the race, we do get another safety car coming out for Gary Jacobson. His car pulls over on the side of the road on fire. Um, he apparently dropped two cylinders. And then an oil fire sparked, um, which brought out the safety car again. So the few cars that still needed, well, the few, about half the field still needed to get the remaining uh, leaders in to fulfill their mandatory requirement. Um, They dived in at this point if they hadn't already done so. And filled up on fuel up to the amount that they needed, 120 liters. One of those cars was Nick Perkat, who came in and <laughs> lit his entire pit bay on fire in the process. Um, so, his fuel links decoupled, I believe, um, at the nozzle. Uh, fuel went all over the ground, all over his car. They put the car down off the jacks, and then his hot exhaust ignited the petrol on the ground, um, setting the whole pit bay on fire. Um, luckily, luckily... Most of the guys there, not just the um, BJR boys, but everybody around pulled out a fire extinguisher and managed to put that fire out before it reached the fuel rig that holds all the fuel in it because that would have been an absolute disaster. Um, Had that gone up to that point, that would have been awful. Um, But they did manage to put it out in the pit bay and then Nick Perkatz drives down to the end of pit lane before his car properly ignites. He gets out of the car... um, some of the boys from the Red Bull garage, the ones that they're the furthest up the lane, uh, come with fire extinguishers along with some other pit crew marshals and put the fire out. And he actually gets back in and drives off again <laughs> and finishes under safety car. Um, so yeah, we had a safety car and then because of Nick Perkat's incident, we did not get going again. Um, the safety car finished the race. And the order that they finished in was... Shane Van Gisbergen in first place, which I honestly didn't believe. <laughs> it was amazing that, that that he ended up winning that race. Uh, Fabian Coulthard in second and Cameron Waters in third after tangling with Nick Perkat earlier on. Uh, managed to recover to a podium position. He could have been on for a race win, um, but some of the people ahead of him also needed to pit again for petrol to get to the end. And uh, he didn't, so he got lucky in that respect. He did tangle with Nick Perkat and... Lucky to finish where he was, basically. Uh, Anton in fourth place of mega drive. Mega effort from him. Gutted that he couldn't do better. Um, he deserved to win. It would have been great. But that's that's the way it goes. That's racing, you know. Uh, Chaz Mostert up 11 spots to fifth. Great job. Uh, Rick Kelly. You're going to see a lot of big movers here. Up nine spots to sixth place. He did good as well. James Golding with, I think, his career best finish of seventh. Up 13 spots. Uh, from Lee Holdsworth, and then Michael Caruso up 15 spots to ninth. Uh, great job from him on his return to Gary Rogers, with Simona up 13 spots to 10th with her best ever finish, I believe, her best career finish. Uh, Scott McLaughlin managing to recover to 11th spot, which was pretty incredible, actually, uh, followed by Tim Slade in 12th and James Courtney in 13th. Jack LeBrock up 7 spots to 14th. Scott Pye in 15th. Todd Hazelwood. He fell down 12 spots to finish in 16th. Unfortunate for him, but it was a chaotic race. I didn't get to see why he fell down so far, but that's 
it was such a chaotic race that I'm not surprised that he did manage. He did actually end up falling down the field so far. Still, a mega effort in qualifying. Uh, Macaulay Jones in 17th, Andre Heimgarten in 18th. I believe he was involved in various incidents throughout the weekend. Nick Perkat in 19th, not last. Uh, David Reynolds, after his dramas, did finish in 20th, and Will Davison in 21st. Um, I don't remember why Will Davison had a problem. Definitely had a problem because he finished so many laps down, but um, I don't remember what it was. Oh, I'm going to feel like an idiot when I do remember after this goes up. And not classified, Gary Jacobson, Mark Winterbottom, and Jamie Winkup, Mark Winterbottom, having various issues and tangling with various people. Um, not just wasn't his weekend. Just wasn't his weekend. But a pretty exciting race on the Sunday um i was glued to it as soon as it started raining i was i was keen and uh it didn't disappoint um but let's go to the championship points after that very strange weekend it's wait for it guess who it is it's scott mclaughlin in first place with 2168 points he actually lost his lead. He's, and Fabian Coulthard is now within a round result of Scott McLaughlin. Two race wins. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, 292 points behind is Fabian Coulthard. Remembering that 300 points per round, 150 points for a win. Um, so 300 points every round is on offer. Um, and... Fabian is just within that. Uh, nearly 500 points behind Scott McLaughlin is Shane Van Gisbergen in third, followed by Chaz Mostert, who is 30 points behind Shane. And then six points behind Chaz is David Reynolds. So that those three, very close together. Uh, Jamie Winkup in sixth, Cameron Waters in seventh, Nick Perkat in eighth, Will Davison in ninth, and Lee Holdsworth rounding out the top ten. With Anton Di Pasquale gaining a boost to his points up into 11th. Uh, Tim Slade in 12th. James Courtney in 13th. Mark Winterbottom in 14th. Andre Heimgardner in 15th. And the first of the Nissans. Good on him. Um, Scott Pye in 16th. Todd Hazelwood in 17th. Rick Kelly in 18th. James Golding in 19th. Simona in 20th. Macaulay Jones in 21st. Jack LeBrock in 22nd. Gary Jacobson in 23rd. Richie Stanaway in 24th, where he will probably stay <laughs> because he's been gone for a while. Uh, Jack Smith, who's had, what, four rounds now? Three rounds? Hasn't been able to eclipse Richie Stanaway anyway. Uh, Chris Piffer, if you're keeping track, Chris Piffer and Michael Caruso. Chris Piffer's had one in, exactly one more race than uh, Caruso. Um, and Tim Blanchard as well in last after his one wildcard entry at Barbagello, I think. On to the teams. We have DJR, of course, at the top, followed by Red Bull again. Um, the gap is 877 points. I uh, don't think that gap's going to be closed by the end of the year, but you never know. Um, the Tickford racing entries of Lee Holdsworth and Chas Mostert are in third, down by another 400 almost points to Red Bull. Uh, there might be something on there. Erebus, who are... Oh, 60 points behind Tickford in fourth, followed by Tickford again with Cameron Waters and Will Davison in fifth. Uh, BJR in sixth, and Walkinshaw and Andretti United in seventh. Kelly Racings, Andre Heimgartner and Rick Kelly in eighth. Gary Rogers in ninth. Simona and Jacobson in tenth. And then the single car entrance, Mark Winterbottom, Todd Hazelwood, Macaulay Jones and Jack LeBrock rounding out to the Constructors points. So, it was an interesting weekend. Um, I think I, I needed a good race. I was a bit a little bit disenfranchised with supercars lately just because of how much Scotty had been winning. And it was good to see a chaotic, wild race. I really enjoyed it. Uh, let me know what you think of the race, obviously, as always. But, in the news, Ford are on the brink of a manufacturer's title. They only need one more race win. Remembering that the manufacturer's title, um, Ford or Holden, that is, or Nissan, of course, 
um, is based on race wins, not points. Um, and Ford only need one more race win total before they lock out the championship for Ford, which is pretty crazy that we're saying that this early in the year, but that's what happens, uh, especially since towards the tail end of the year, there's less races because endurance races come up, of course. Um, so if you're a Ford fan, if you're a Mustang fan, uh, it's fair to say that you are having a good time because they have definitely dominated this year. That is for sure. Um, in other news, Supercars is changing the ballast again in the cars for center of gravity reasons. So if you remember at the start of the year after Albert Park in Melbourne, um, the Holdens had 6.8 kilos of ballast added to the roof. While the Mustangs had 27 kilos clamped to their roll bars. Um, the new center of gravity changes. We'll see the 6.8 kilos that was added to the Holdens removed. While 9 of the 27 kilos added to the Mustangs will be taken out. And some of the composite parts will be replaced with steel roof beams. And the existing ballast in the Nissan will also be lowered down to the sump. Um, this is apparently to create more parity with center of gravity. Um, I, why didn't they figure this out before? I don't know. That's just life, I guess. I don't know. Like, we, They started the season and then they changed it during the season once and now they're changing the center of gravity again. Like... You know, come on, guys. Like, surely you should have flagged this when you first tested the center of gravity in Melbourne or at the start of the year. Like, you know, it's... I don't know. These things happen, I guess. Um, they're making amendments to the rules. Nothing you can do about it. But that is what's happening with that. And now we move into silly season talk. And the first thing on our silly season list is that triple eight. Racing has extended, remembering that Triple Eight is the Red Bull team, is it has extended its deal with both Holden and Red Bull. So, the contract with the Holden manufacturer team, as well as the Red Bull title sponsorship, was uh, was ending. Is that the right word? Ending this year? Came to an end this year? Ends this? I don't know. Whatever. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the the we'll start with the Holden thing, um, the manufacturing. So uh, let me rewind a bit and explain it a bit better. Triple um, Eight is the uh, Holden factory team. It used to be um, HRT. Now it's Red Bull Triple Eight Holden Racing Team. The whole name, um, and. Um, They've now extended that deal with Holden to the end of 2021, I believe. Um, yep. So that will continue. We'll continue to see a manu an, an actual manufacturer presence in supercars because keeping in mind that there is no manufacturer team for Ford or Nissan anymore. It's just Holden these days. Um, so it's good to see some more manufacturer support uh, for the Holden for any manufacturer. Um, it's good to see that vote of confidence and also Red Bull have extended their title sponsorship to the end of 2021 as well. Um, which, you know, if you're a fan of RBHRT, then you'll be glad to see that, that they've maintained their relationships basically is all that means. Um, so that's all I got to do with that. But also concerning RBHRT, which is really hard to say, I'm going to say Red Bull Racing, um, is Shane Van Gisbergen, whose contract was up at the end of this year, has been confirmed until the end of 2020. So he's been, his contract has been extended by one year um, until the end of 2020. Um, interesting that it's a one-year deal, but that locks in both the Red Bull drivers, Jimmy Winkup and Shane, until 2020. And then they will be free to negotiate after that. Uh, also in silly season speculation, uh, McLaughlin and Coulthard. Remember I spoke last week at length about whether or not they'd be keeping Coulthard. Uh, both drivers have been locked in for another year until the end of 2020. 
Um, I don't believe Scott McLaughlin's contract was up. I believe he was always going to 2020. But Cool Tides was, and he has now been confirmed to remain on the team for at least one more year. Um, which this will put Chaz Moster in an interesting spot. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, Chaz Mostert's contract with Tickford is also coming to an end. Uh, he was pretty highly linked for that Coulthard seat, should Coulthard go from DJR. Um, and now he won't be able to do that. And now there's even talk of him being heavily linked to a Walkinshaw Andretti seat with James Courtney as his teammate, which would be a very interesting pairing. Um, now, <laughs> what do I think he'll do? Um, I think it wouldn't be a very smart move to switch from Tickford to Walkinshaw Andretti at this stage. Um, maybe if he'd won a championship already, it'd be it wouldn't be a bad idea. But um, if I was him, if I was going to stay in supercars because he has shown interest in racing series outside of supercars internationally, I would stay in Tickford. Uh, Winterbottom's gone. He was the figurehead of that team. Now, Mostert is the figurehead of that team. Build the team up around yourself and the Mustang and go ahead and bring it to DJR and Red Bull. That's what I would do if I was him. Um, And if he stays in supercars, I fully expect him to stay at Tickford. He might go to Walkinshaw. Um, Maybe building up a weaker team around himself would be more interesting to him. But I think he's in it for titles and race wins. And if he wants that, the easiest way to do it would be with Tickford and to already build that team around him, um, which he could very well do. That team could use a good driver to uh, rally behind, and he could very well take that charge. Um, but he's not the only driver out of contract. Other drivers out of contract are Simone Di Silvestro, Scott Pye, James Courtney. So both of the Walkinshaw Andretti guys are up. Lee Holdsworth, as well as Cameron Waters, the other two Tickford drivers. Um, Todd Hazelwood, Anton Di Pasquale, Jack LeBrock, and Andre Heimgartner are also up for contract this year, along with others, I'm pretty sure. But those are the ones I have confirmation on. Um, Jack LeBrock, Anton Di Pasquale, and Andre Heimgartner are all in their second year of supercars. Um, Heimgartner and Pasquale both got their first podiums this year at Phillip Island. Um... I highly rate both of those drivers. I think they're really good. And given the right um, tools, I think they could really prove themselves to be to be quite formidable in this field. Um, especially Heimgartner. I think he's got that edge over, um, over Pasquale. I really do. I think he's got some good stuff in him. Um, and there will be teams that are interested in both of those drivers, 100%. Um... Obviously, the teams that they're at already will definitely want to keep them because they are good. And uh, I think Heimgartner is leading the points charge for Kelly Racing this year. And Pasquale had a great... I mean, this performance this weekend has shown what he can do. Um, And his podium at Phillip Island as well. Um, So he's putting in the performances when he needs to. Along with his couple of top 10 shootout appearances and things like that, he's been quite impressive on the single lap pace anyway. Uh, Jack LeBrock, I'm not so sure about. Um, His contract at Techno until the end of the year was in question until a couple of months ago uh, when they confirmed that he would be staying. So I hope he stays. I think he's quite good. I just don't think he has the car under him. Um, Remember, he did get a fifth place at Tasmania last year in his debut season. Um, And, you know, not anyone can do that. And that car last year wasn't great. Um, I think he's quite good. I think if he had a chance to prove himself, I think he would show it. Unfortunately, I don't think he's had the chance to prove himself. It, the The techno car this year seems to be pretty awful. Um, they've been sort of nowhere all year. Um, and last year, you could even tell if you look back at some of the results, he was doing better last year. He was more in the inf- in the the midfield. This year, he's at the backfield. He's at the back of the pack most races. And I don't think that's down to him. I think that's down to the car. Um, it'd be a shame if he was dropped, but I wouldn't be surprised. He hasn't exactly torn the field up this year. And unfortunately, the year that your contract is up is the year that you want to have that car underneath you. Um, hopefully, they see something in him, just like how um, 
Gary Rogers saw something in Stanaway, even though the Tickford car last year was so dire. Um, I hope Techno keeps him or someone else brings him on. I think he's a talent, but, you know, who knows what will happen. Todd Hazelwood, he is really proving himself this year. Um, it, I don't know what I would do if I was Todd Hazelwood, but, um, you know, he came in last year in a team that really struggled. That car was very bad. Um, and this year, they've... Given him, they've given him an all right car, and he's really taken off with it. He has given them some good results. He's doing really well. Um, he's had some really standout performances. Like, good on him. Really good on him. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if there were a few teams interested in him. And I'm sure Matt Stone Racing will want to keep him as well. Um, what Matt Stone Racing need is they need a driver that can be consistent. Um, so what Team 18 have done with Winterbottom is something that they would probably want to do. So a James Courtney. Um, oh, who else would there be? James Courtney, a Fabian Coulthard, except his contract's not up anymore. Um, a Lee Holdsworth, maybe. One of the older drivers um, that's been around a lot and has proven to be fast. Uh, James Courtney would be really good for them. And just develop that car, build the team up, um get them some consistent results, consistent points, and put that car more at the forefront because they've got a lot of financial troubles as well. Um, Hazelwood's good. I think he's a future talent as well. Uh, but I don't think he'll ever find his legs in a team that's sort of always off, always on, kind of, if you know what I mean. Um, but Matt Stone really needs someone who's consistent and can bring home the car and develop it for them. And I think James Courtney would be a good fit for them if they want to try and tempt him away from Rock and Show Andretti, because his contract is up this year, and that would be a good fit. Um, on the other hand, Rock and Show Andretti also needs someone who can, who is experienced, that can help build that car up, and um, they'll probably want to keep James Courtney at all costs. But that's the way things go. Basically, what I'm saying is that I think all the rookies are talents, <laughs> and I want them all to stay. Um, the only question mark I do have is um, Simona and Scott Pye. Um, we've never seen Simona in a car that's not a Nissan. But that being said, Rick Kelly and Heimgartner in particular have proven that you can get decent results in that Nissan. Um, and she hasn't. She just hasn't proven that. Um, I don't know how I feel about about her or driving ability. Um but she has expressed an interest in staying, and I'm sure one of the teams would be happy to have her. Um, she must bring good marketing and publicity with her. Um, so even one of the cash, more cash-strapped teams like um, Matt Stone Racing would probably wouldn't mind to have her just for the extra marketing opportunities that, that, that she would bring with her. Um, so I'm sure if she wants a seat, she will definitely find one. Um, but I'm always undecided on how I feel about her because on one hand, she's better than I think she's better than Jacobson this year at least but he's also a rookie um, and on the other hand um, on the other hand I think she could be doing better considering where the other two Nissans are um, but it's always possible that there are diff like there are differences in the cars that we don't really know about uh, there's any there's all kinds of variables that we might not be aware of um, but yeah, I hope she stays. I think she's good for the sport, if anything. Um, and I'm sure she will be able to find a seat if she wants one. Um, but she has shown some signs of going back to Formula E in Europe, so we will see what happens with that one. And um, Scott Pye as well. Um, compared to James Courtney this year, he hasn't been that great. Um, he really hasn't. And... I know Courtney's hugely experienced, but he did beat him last year quite comfortably. Um, and I'm not sure what's going on in that guard. That car's not great, though. And I think if they if they drop Pi, if they drop Pi in favor of someone better, in inverted commas, like Mostert, I wouldn't be surprised. But if they drop him for someone is not really like a proven race winner, then I will be surprised because I think Scott Pi is good enough to be on that team 100%. 
Um, he did win their only race win for like 10 years or something last year at Melbourne. Um, and he finished in the top 10 on the points last year as well. But um, I think he needs he needs to be doing better this year as well, especially when it's his year, the year the contract is up. Um, this weekend in particular, he's been quite weak. But he has had good weekends as well. So I don't know. I go back and forth on Scott Pye a lot. Um, and lastly, the Tickford guys, uh, Cameron Waters, I think is safe. 100%. Um, Lee Holdsworth, I think, has been solid. He, I was very critical of him at the start of the year. He wasn't performing. He's gotten a lot better. I think he's gotten a lot more comfortable in that car, um, which is good because I was worried for his future. And I think they'll keep him at this stage unless they, they pull someone really good into their side, um, which I don't think there's many drivers who are up and available for um, Then I think they'll keep him. Um, or they'll drop one of them. If, if either of them go, it'll be Holdsworth. Um, then they might bring in one of these younger talents that I've been talking about, like a, a Hazelwood in that car or a Jack LeBrock in that car would be pretty good to see. Um, but it sort of depends on Mostert. Mostert's sort of the key to this silly season. If he goes to Walkinshaw and Dreddy, there'll be a huge shuffling around of of drivers because suddenly a top seat will be available and Scott Pye will be probably Scott Pye will be forced out or James Courtney one or the other and there'll be a major shuffling around of seats um, and if Chas Mostert leaves to go to a different sport entirely there'll be more shuffling around of seats because suddenly we're short one driver so we could see someone come up from um, Super 2 which um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a Bryce Fullwood up or a Thomas Randall maybe. He's linked to Tickford um, to come up in fill some of those seats. If Mostert was to leave, and who would replace Mostert at Tickford? I have no idea. I really don't. Um, so sort of the key to this season lies with Mostert's decision. Um, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But look out for that announcement that Mostert has chosen to stay at Tickford or go somewhere else, because that's really the key to this. If he stays at Tickford, um, I don't expect a hugely massive silly, silly season. Um, if he leaves, though, if he goes anywhere else, to another team or to another racing series or whatever, um, I expect to see a huge shuffling around of drivers. But we'll see what happens once that announcement comes around. Now, let's talk about the next event. Which is the Ipswich, that's of course. Um, the Queensland Raceway Super Sprint, um, the paperclip. Quite a short track uh, at Ipswich in Queensland. It's in another three weeks from now with two, sorry, with the old three qualifying formats coming back for race 19, then practice again, and then another three qualifying format for race 20 on the Sunday. Uh, so that's in three weeks' time. Um, hopefully you're watching it. Hopefully you enjoy it. Hopefully it's a great race. I always look forward to this track with its nice long straights, plenty of overtaking opportunities. But until then, until next time, I have been Kendall from Bearded Kendall. Sorry, Kendall from Bearded Kendall. I'll see you on the next episode of the V8 Supercars fancast. See you later.